Hi guys. It's good to be back here. I think I recognize most of you, but if I haven't met you yet, my name's Natalie. This is my husband, Jake, here. Um, if I hadn't met you, then that probably means you started coming here in the last six months, because up until six months ago, I had been a part of this ministry for about nine or 10 years, and I absolutely love this place. And so it just feels like coming home, and it feels... Um, like the most comfortable place I can be this morning. So I'm really stoked to share with you guys today. And today I'm sharing with you something that, um, that might seem like the farthest thing from my personality. Um, if you don't know me, I'm probably more on the reserved ends of things and not super um, crazy or high energy or any of those things. But I'm going to talk to you today about joy. And hopefully you can just take me as a credible witness that God gives us joy. It's not something that we necessarily just like are born with and some people don't have. And I think that's some of the stuff that like I've sold myself short in in the past, thinking that joy was not something for all of us, just for some of us that come out with this like spark of joy in their personalities. But actually, it is a promise of the Christian life that it would be filled with joy. And so today, I just want to share that with you. Um, and so I'm like the, I'm just going to say the most disorganized person ever. Maybe I'm just lazy and bad at being organized. There's a possibility I could be more organized and I'm not, but I got my pile of things here and I'm excited to share with you guys. And um, before we even kick off, I just, I had a thought this last week and um, yesterday I was reading this proverb, they like clicked together so well, I wanted to share it with you before we start. So it's Proverbs 18:12. It says, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. And I was thinking about this week, how true it is, like we're very comfortable with sharing opinions or even judgments about things. We love talking about other people and things and what they are doing and that in our like shallow conversations, that tends to be a lot of what it is. And I don't know if this is your experience in your life groups or maybe with your friend groups, um, but I, I think we hit a wall, like I've hit this wall at points of frustration where I recognize that we're much more comfortable making judgments and expressing our opinions about the word of God and maybe truths that he has. And we'll go like, we'd like sit in a group and we'd much rather talk about the extremes of if you took a biblical principle too far and how that could be dangerous dangerous than actually seeking to have understanding of how it might actually apply to our own lives. So this morning, if that, that easily can come up even in this conversation about joy, you can automatically have the, the flags go off in your head that go, that is for somebody else. Or yeah, like some people look like they have joy, but that must be fake. Or like th these are the 10 ways that we can get this wrong. And I just want to challenge us to be the ones that take pleasure in understanding, in truly taking a biblical truth and applying it to our own lives. That means we kind of have to show up honestly. That is the thing that I can bring you this morning. That is part of my personality. It's probably like I'm really bad at faking things. So if we turn that on the other side, I'm just really going to be genuinely honest with you guys. And so I want to invite you to also be genuinely honest with yourself. As I share really what God's like shown me through this, um, I hope that you seek actual understanding. Don't be a fool that just moves quickly to make um, some kind of expression of your opinion or a judgment on what I have to say. Seek to see if the Lord has something for you to understand that will actually change your life. And we'll see what God does with that. So um, would you guys pray with me really quick? Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here this morning. I thank you for the truth of your word. And I pray that your spirit would speak through me, that only your truth would be heard and everything else would be um, forgotten. God, would you just soften and prepare our hearts right now? Um, would you be stirring in us a deeper desire for more of you? And um, would you just be glor glorified and honored in this time? In your name we pray. Amen. Um, okay, so sharing with you guys about joy, um, I was hanging out with Michaela on Friday and we were talking about like, what is joy? And it's a pretty hard thing to define. Um, I forgot last service, but I looked at um, the actual dictionary definition of it. Here it goes. A feeling of great pleasure or happiness. 
doesn't really like tell you very much. You're like, so is it happiness? Is that all that is, or is like a feeling? That doesn't seem to like cut it, I think, especially for the way that we talk about joy or even like the context in which we use the word joy. I don't think that that's enough, but I do think that it's a precious commodity in short supply in our world. One of those things that it's like, oh, I, I know it when I see it, because it's rare and it comes into a room and it like hits me different. And sometimes we don't know what to do with it. And um, that is my friend Paige in the back there. She is the best person, my life partner. And <laughs> um, I love her so much. And <laughs> she brings joy into a room. And we might just be like the yin and yang of opposites. Um, but she brings so much joy in life that I think she walks into some room and people, some rooms and people go, is that real? Because it's so out of the ordinary in our world. And whether that is just the gift that Paige is in her personality, or it is also who she is mixed with the joy of Christ, that she brings that into a space. I think she's like, I love her so much. And she is the example of, of something more than this world has to offer that is good. And it's good for us to get a little taste of that, to grow an appetite for it. Um, if you guys ever go to Costco, you know, and you get like the Costco samples, this will not be Costco because Costco is like the biggest sham. You get a sample of something and it tastes really good in one bite. But if you have a 500 pack of it, it's not good anymore. I've never finished an entire Costco pack of something and been like stoked on it. But I mean, we're like so sick of whatever the thing is we bought. But still, you walk around and you just get this little taste and you're like, I want some more of that. And that's what I wanna to do today, to kind of just give us a sampling. I don't have a good explanation or definition for what joy is. I might have some things that I think come out of it or what it might look like, but ultimately I hope that this morning we just start to grow a taste for it. I think sometimes, I give the example of the last service, like if you just decide like sushi is not for me, I will not eat raw fish, and you just make this decision, you never care about missing it. It doesn't sound appealing. It's fine that you don't have it. It's for other people. But today, maybe let's just be a little open-minded, open our appetite, our palate a little bit and go, maybe this is for me. As you listen to this, maybe there's bits of it that you wish you had tasted and that you would realize might actually be for you. So if joy is this thing that is... Um, that is otherworldly, that our world doesn't have. I think there's kind of three ways that um, we miss out on it. We don't experience it. And then we'll talk about what joy actually is and what it might look like in our lives. So I think the first way that we miss out on joy, the reason that we don't actually have it, is that it's hard to grasp. We've already talked about it. And I, like I said, I'm lazy also. So I think what I tend to do is when something's difficult, when it seems like a lot of work, I'm really tempted to just trade that for something a lot easier like happiness. And not even actually having happiness, but like the idea that I might one day get something. I'd rather have that than do the hard work of truly possessing something that is difficult. And I'm gonna be really honest with you guys. So this, these are examples from my life, from things that I've probably thought in the last week or two. But I think because uh, joy is hard to grasp, I instead kind of settle for happiness and I think I'll be happy if. I'll be happy if I feel physically good. You ever know like when you're sick and it just sounds so good to be able to like breathe through your nose again and you're like, I'll be happy one day if I can breathe through my nose again, if I could taste food. So I, that, I think that thought like, I'll be happy if I'm physically well. I'll be happy if I'm physically able to do the things that I want to do, or I look the way that I want to, do, to look, or I'm capable of doing all these things. I also think I'll be happy if I can finish the stressful thing in front of me. I'll be happy if I can go somewhere new, if I can have something nice. I'll be happy if people don't bother me. I'll be happy if I can make others around me happy. It's a lot of things that I exchange for that. And I think happiness, I want to propose that happiness is really thin. It's like a piece of paper. I know that it is about to disintegrate the moment that I'm experiencing it. If happy, a lot of times for me is like, uh, like I said, Jake is my husband and my best friend and favorite person in the world. And 
like a really good date is the sweetest thing to me. And so sometimes I'll trade that. I'll go, I'll be happy if we can have a really good connecting date. Because the truth is, even when you're married to your best friend and they're the, my favorite person in the world, there's some dates that just aren't that great. And it just doesn't feel like we're quite connecting or clicking or whatever it might be. And I might just build that up that much that finally sometime we'll get to go on a date and it'll be clicking and it'll be fine and it'll just be so sweet. And I know even in that, I can suddenly get this like pit of disappointment because I know it's gonna be over soon. And just like a piece of paper on like the top of water, like it's not gonna last long. Pretty soon it's gonna dissolve and it's gonna fall apart. And I know that's what my happiness is gonna look like. It's gonna fade. So I wanna propose that joy is something that is deep. It's soul deep. And soul is already kind of like a hard thing to communicate. Um, in our life group that we lead with some young marrieds like the Powers and the Cosleys, um, some really good friends and the Cables back there. Um, we're reading this book called Soul Keeping and he talks all about just trying to help us understand the importance of our souls, that it is our will, our mind, our body all encompassed. It's the whole of who we are and it goes deep and it matters, but it's also like a very neglected part of us. So of course, we're never gonna feel deep things like deep soul words like joy if we never really acknowledge the entirety of it or even take care of it well. Joy is when our soul, having to realize that we have a soul, is well-ordered before God. We come to him in our actual need and position ourselves in a position of humility and neediness before God and in his presence get to receive joy and goodness. The other way that I think that we miss out on joy or don't experience it is that we have a real enemy set on robbing us of joy. Like I said, all of those, those things, because I like trade joy for happiness and pursue that, and I think all of those things, those are actually lies. And John 8, 44 says that, that the enemy is the father of all lies. And I just want to challenge you something in this, something this week. I think if you think any of the kind of lies that I think, would you just begin to like verbalize them? Not let them be the conversation that's between like you and your, your own self, or I think to be honest with you and your own soul, but instead like bring a friend into that, bring your life group into that and just verbalize that lie. I believe I'll be happy if my parents stop fighting or I'll be happy if this situation goes away or I'll be happy if we get done with high school and finals, whatever that thing is. Because I think once we speak them out loud, this has been my experience and maybe it's yours. Once we speak them out loud, we like know for a fact they're lies. We see right through them. But when they're quiet and they're in our heads, they can sound really, really true. Or we just like don't really acknowledge them enough to fight them. And then to take it a step further than that, be someone who actually knows God's word and has the truth to fight against those lies and then match those two together. And then we start to actually begin to fight this fight against the enemy because I think when we continue to speak those lies to ourselves, to our own souls, we're actually doing the work of the enemy for him and he doesn't have to do anything. And one of those really big ones is this belief that joy, which would actually be my third point, we believe that joy is just a nice idea, not something to experience now. It's like a subtle lie. Like, okay, like maybe joy is really nice and we might sing about it in our worship songs or something like that, but maybe God meant it for like one day when we're in heaven. But as long as that I'm, I'm on earth, I just have to like continue trudging along kind of out of obligation or kind of pretending, or maybe we hear about joy and we don't really experience it. So we're gonna keep faking it till we make it. And maybe by the time we get to heaven, we actually have joy but it still all goes back to what it talks about in John 10.10, 10, if you want to turn there with me really quick. John 10.10. 10. So if the enemy of our souls, there is an actual enemy that seeks to keep you in distance, in disconnection from God, to be a soul just gradually dwindling away to death, if that's all that the enemy wants, this is, this is what it says, that this thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal our joy, 
kill our life slowly but surely and destroy the connection that we have between others. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and it abundantly. Something that's abundant, that's like such a big word. But I think in order to experience it, to experience joy and abundant life, something big, we kind of need a big capacity for it. But as long as we don't acknowledge our soul or really deal on a level that has depth like a soul, like a well that is is endless, but we only decide to sit on the very top surface like a piece of paper flat across the top, happiness is about all that we can ever hope for. But when we begin to dig deeper than that and allow that, I think it's scary. There's like deep depths of pain under that. We don't know what we're gonna find if we go digging into that. Um, But I think, where did it go? I think that we only experience the goodness and power of God to the depth that we're really willing to acknowledge his existence or our need. So often we just kind of skate along the top and skip all of that. And then there's no need for joy right now. There's no capacity for it, but we're born with this deep capacity to actually receive it. Um, Joy and abundant life are soul deep. This all encompassing the whole of who we are, if we don't like really sit in those things, then we never get to enjoy all of the fullness of the goodness of joy. Um, I think it means we have to stop skimming the surface. It means we have to stop just being deep in our churchy moments. If you feel like worship is your deepest moment of the week, we're gonna miss out on joy completely because joy isn't a temporary like happiness thing because of our circumstances. It continues throughout all of our days. And I also think that if we want to experience deep soul joy, we have to start actually walking with Jesus in the neglected parts of our inner life. And I think, um, if I'm being honest a little bit, I, I don't remember like exactly the point in my life, but I would say it was in the last several years that I started thinking, I think there's more to this like abundant lifeline than I'm, like I hear about it in the Bible, we talk about it a lot, but I think there's more to it than what I'm experiencing. Even kind of that lie that I would tell myself that like joy was for other people, like that's their gift, but not really mine to like really grasp or get. Um, and... I started to realize that there were these like little pockets of my life that I probably wasn't bringing the Holy Spirit so so fluidly into. Spaces where I felt like, well, I'm sitting here in worship or I'm sitting here in church and I really am hearing from the Holy Spirit and I'm really connecting with God. But then the way that I listened to the Spirit drastically changed when I got home or when I was driving in the car or when I was making breakfast for my daughter that I had these like, moments and spaces that God had no place in. Not that I was doing anything terrible, but was I really inviting him into them? That God wants to really meet us in all of the pockets of our lives. And so I think if we want to start to experience the full goodness of the joy and abundant life that God intends for us to experience on this earth, in this life, that really does mean you have to bring Jesus into all of those moments, knowing that the Holy Spirit is in you and goes with you into all of those spaces. And there's really no space that's not holy that he's not invited into. He's actually very present in, and he wants to start to reveal himself and start working in those things. And then the last thing I think is just to be, to bring him deep needs, which means needing deeply. And that's not a very like comfortable thing for us to do as people. No one really likes being needy and we really don't like being needy and then knowing that we can do something about it, even if that's just taking our neediness to God. We'd rather just stay needy forever than like do the hard work of actually praying about those things, actually being honest about them and acknowledging them. But I think that's where we start to reach those depths where we get to experience the goodness of God. And then these are the things that I feel like really changed. And um, in my preparation for this sermon, I ignored the book of Philippians initially because it's kind of like the joy book of the Bible. And if anyone ever does a study on joy, you probably go through Philippians. And I was trying to find other spaces. And you know what? 
I still ended up back here. Because I think that when we actually start to believe the things in Philippians and start to believe that they are for us and that God actually wants to see humility and goodness and, um, and peace and contentment and hope in our lives, if those are actual things for us to experience in his presence, then we start to experience all of his joy and goodness that he intends for us. So I'm just going to give you again, like I said, little samples of things, just a, a picture of if this thing, we truly took it heart that this is a real thing to reach down to the depths of who we are and we could experience it, then we'd start to step into this joy. And if you feel yourself kind of like, like cringe at certain things and go like, ah, I don't know about that. I don't think so. Or that's not quite true in my life. Would you just be attentive to that? To seek more understanding, to go this week, I'm going to dig into that a little bit more because this is a real thing. And I think as we start to do that, then we start to see real change in our lives. Um, so starting in Philippians 1, 8, found that hope really changes things. And in Philippians 1, oh, I said it wrong again. Philippians 1, 6. I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Or just like we were singing before, we, if we actually believe that we are actually the canvas and the clay and he is an artist and a potter actually using everything in our lives, I think not only it redeems, like, like sometimes we talk about hope, like it's hope in eternity and that our, our security and our eternities are secure, but also that there's hope for the hard things that we go through that it's not just purposeless pain. It's not discomfort for just the sake of the world being broken. It's not just crap that we go through and we have to deal with, but because God actually cares about us and loves us, that he's using every one of those difficult experiences to shape and mold us, to make us more like Christ. The next thing that um, I think actually changes things is the peace and contentment that we get from Christ. Philippians 3, 7 talks about all the things that Paul has, but he says um, in verse, yeah, seven, whatever I, gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. It's knowing when we, val when we, no, when what we value most is looking like Christ, suddenly things shift and we can always win. There's not a need for discontentment because in the discontentment, God is using it to shape me and that's actually what I wanted all along. It's like this resiliency that we can have to life. And I can tell you I'm currently in it, but that hope, the peace and the contentment are very real things that in the midst of something that seems like, oh, I feel like this is going sideways. And I think just in the way that we live our lives, what we perceive, it looks like, really looks like life is going sideways right now. Whatever this circumstance might be, whatever this person's reaction to my, my actions, whatever it might be, like this looks like life going sideways and I wanna just give up or I wanna feel terrible about it or my own like overtaking responsibility for things in my life. I, I feel like distraught that it's like my fault that these things happened. But instead, there's so much space for God to move when I have this peace and contentment, that what I actually want is to be shaped to be more like Jesus. And he's using this, whatever feels like a tragedy or a disaster in my life to actually shape me more like him, to even shape the people in my life to be more like him. And he's much better at doing that than I even am, where I'm trying to like position people to grow a certain way in my life. And God's so good at doing that naturally through the things that happen in this world, redeeming all of the brokenness of the world and just being glorified through all of it. Um, this is my funny word. I don't have a better word for it. Um, the thing that I think joy actually changes is that we actually start to have a vibrancy about us. I don't know if there's a better word for that. Maybe 
abundance or human flourishing, but when you when someone is flourishing, you start to see an abundance about them. But as I was talking about before, kind of just living in the world of lies and joy is not really for me and I'm going to keep going after happiness and, and a lot of disappointment because life isn't actually as happy as you think it would be, that we start to be like diminished people. Like if you ever saw someone malnourished and they just get smaller and they, they seem like they shrink as a person. Um, but Philippians 4... 19 says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Let me say that again for like the things where you feel like there's not enough, where you have need, where you feel disappointed, just receive this for a minute to the deep parts of who you are. And my God who is all powerful, who is good, who is worthy, who sees all of you, who knows your need, will supply every need of yours according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. When we start to actually truly take some of those things like deep down into our core, everything I actually right, need right now in this moment, God has completely provided for. I think we start to like expand as people to like breathe deep and start to show a vibrancy that is different, that does kind of strike the world funny. You walk into a room and they're like, why are you so okay? Right? Like whether life sucks or not, I think just like being really okay is probably like kind of shocking in the world, but really actually just, why are you so good? People aren't good. We're generally like complainers by nature. So why do you walk into a space feeling like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I got it all. We're fine. God's got all of my needs. That is something that the world does not have. And I think the last thing is humility. And that's not just like a low view of ourselves. Of course, Philippians 2 is the best chapter about humility. But I think it's more than that. It's a freedom from self-consciousness. It's absolutely a zapper of joy, a deep insecurity, a walking into a room and feeling like it matters so much that you say the right thing or if you see someone to talk to or if people still think you're funny or if they like you or any of those things or just a deep hatred of yourself after you walk out of a conversation and you're like, I'm such an idiot. Why did I ever say that? That freedom from that is so good and so sweet. And we don't really have like a lifeline out of that apart from Jesus, right? Like, I don't know, just be like, ah, I'm an idiot, like make it a joke after a while and then it's fine. Like the only kind of lifeline freedom from that really deep bondage to an obsession with ourselves, whether it's much too high a view of ourselves and feeling like we need to, to protect this view of ourselves and meet a certain standard or really low view of ourselves that's just so de self-deprecating that we can never really accept God's love. That's, a, that's real freedom and it comes from Philippians 2. It's a freedom from self-consciousness, self-righteousness, self-reliance, and self-centeredness to Christ's consciousness, Christ's righteousness, Christ's reliance, and Christ's centeredness, which flows from a deep understanding that you are not what you do, that you matter and are cared for deeply, and that Christ paid it all for you. It's not a self-devaluing shame. It is the deeply affirming truth that then flings outward to spread love and value to others. By actually having joy, by actually deeply embodying humility, we impact others. We become a gift by living in God's presence in the goodness of being near to him, which is what I think joy really is. It's just our souls coming into alignment and in neediness, sitting before God, being in the right position before him and being found in his presence in good times and in bad times, that then we get to take that gift and be a gift to others in our lives. So I want to end today with a quote from Soul Keeping. The author of the book Dallas uh, is um, John Ortberg, and he sat with Dallas Willard and took all of these quotes from him, all of this wisdom, and then he tried to make it a little bit more like palatable and understandable for all of us definitely highly recommend this book, but this is his, his challenge that he gave John Orbrook when he was in a season that felt very joyless, that felt very dry. Like 
I feel like maybe a lot of us really identify with, that our Christianity feels like it should be more life-giving and vibrant than it is. I should have some sort of joy to show for this, but I just feel tired, or I just feel worn down, or I just feel like I have to keep running in this like hamster track, or it's never going to end, or I'm going to fall off the treadmill. And this is what he told him, and I hope you just let this sit deeply with you, settle into you, and then kind of talk about it later on this week. He said, arrange your days so that you experience total contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. Hard challenge, incredibly hard. But I believe it's actually very real. It's actually very tangible. If I'm like the best example of like, I don't exude joy and vibrancy and life and silliness the way my friend Paige does, I like envy so many of those things. But true joy in, in my skin, in my personality, who I am, that through the highs and lows of life, maybe life feeling like it's at some of its all-time lows lately, but his joy and his goodness being so consistent when I invite him into every little part of my life. And it's not a striving, it's not a difficult task. It really is just taking neediness to the giver of all good things that has enough for me and watching him show up in that. It's the least work possible and the best life possible. And I want you guys to know that that's a real thing for you. It's not any of those lies that you believe that it's not for you or it's too hard to get to, or it's not for, like, you're just not one of those people that's gonna experience that. So I'm just gonna pray for us for a minute that we would sit in that maybe that that would be a little bit of a hunger or a thirst that God continues to stir up and enlarge. And, and I would challenge you the first place to go with that. If you feel hungry, if you feel like I want more of that, actually sit with Philippians as though that was actually true things that God could work in you. And if you feel like it's impossible, you don't know how he could, that's perfect. Cause you can't make that happen but you can bring that to him and ask him for that. Come to him with deep need and watch him actually deeply provide. God, I thank you so, so much for your goodness and your faithfulness. I thank you for knowing exactly what we need even in this morning. God, we invite you into this moment, into our hearts. To the places where even we are resistant to your truth. Would you be softening us and even being kind enough to allow us to feel a little bit of our need of you, of the lack that we actually live in, God? We want to actually taste and see your abundant life, to experience joy in your presence and to be a blessing to others because we have that joy to share. God, I just pray that over this ministry, that you would continue to make it a place that is vibrant and life-giving, that truly relies on you and experiences your love and your goodness and your power. Would you bless us this week, God, with your presence to continue to work in us, to continue to reveal your truth and remind us of who you are and help us to honor you with our lives. It's in your name we pray, amen. Thanks for hanging out, guys. It was so good to hang out with y'all.